John Put was one of the few Thai masters who studied directly with a John Sao, a John Wan's teacher. I heard him talk one time. He talked about what it was like to hear John Sao teach. He was a novice at the time. He was a John Sao's attendant. He'd get to listen in as like, people would come and ask John Sao how to meditate. And he started with instructions on using the word Bhutto, sometimes breath meditation. And people would ask, well, what does Bhutto mean? He said, don't ask. They'd ask, want to meditate, what are the results going to be? He said, don't ask. Just do it. And if they went home and did it and came back and reported what the results were, if it was something that was obviously wrong, he would say, no, this is not right. Try this. But if the results were going in the right direction, and they'd ask, is this right? He said, whether it's right or not, just keep doing it. He'd never come out and say that it was right, because after all, you're developing a skill. And even though you're heading in the right direction, it's not quite right yet, as you're just getting started. Think about it. We talk about the path, having right view, right resolve, all the way down to right concentration. And when they're all right, that's stream entry. And if you haven't reached stream entry, it means that you're Different factors of the path are not quite right yet. They may be headed in the right direction, but they're not there yet. And so you have to live with approximation, halfway between right and wrong, but hopefully heading in the right direction. It's one of the reasons why the Johns are very slow to praise their students. And John Fuang's attitude was, if he praised a student, I usually meant that that's as far as the student would get. I know in my time with him, he, I never heard him praise me at all. As always, this isn't good enough, this isn't good enough, keep trying, keep trying. But he was encouraging at the same time. Simply that arriving at right. was something that he would never say. And John Mahabua talks about being a teacher is like teaching boxing. You see your student has picked up some of the moves, but he's still leaving himself wide open for getting punched or kicked. So you punch him and kick him right there. Not with ill will, but just to point out to the student, okay, if you're leaving yourself open here, there's still something not quite right yet. So as you practice, this is the attitude you've got to have. You're approximating right. You're between right and wrong, heading in the right direction. And the correct attitude is you're always willing to learn. So when criticism comes, you take it in the spirit with which, with which is offered, which is that the teacher cares. When the teacher doesn't criticize, it means the teacher's given up. So there will be always room for improvement, even as the mind settles down. There are levels of jhana, and even when you're dealing with insight, even though the progress of insight may not follow the steps that they have in the commentaries, still your insights do have a way of developing, getting deeper. As your concentration gets more solid, the things you can see get more refined, as you see more refined things, solve more refined problems, and the concentration goes deeper still. They help each other along. It's not the case that you wait until your concentration is perfect and then develop discernment. One discernment doesn't develop that way. It's in the course of doing the concentration that you notice things you hadn't seen before. Something that was perfectly okay before becomes not okay as you get more skilled. That's one of the reasons why the Buddha uses skills as examples for the practice, or people with skills, cooks, 
soldiers, carpenters, archers. There's no one right way that you can master right away. As John Lee says, you start out, say, weaving a basket, and you look at it, and well, there's a lot to be improved. And so you make improvements, and you look at that next one, and it gets better and better and better. Then you get to the point where it's good enough that you can sell. And then it's up to you. You decide, well, I want to go further than that. Keep developing the skill. So can you say that the baskets that are good enough to sell, are they right? Well, there's a way of making them even righter. They're not wrong, but they're between right and wrong. So this is simply how skills develop. As you get more and more sensitive to what you're doing and the results, and also your standards grow. Get more refined. And it's in working on the skill that your discernment gets developed. Same way as when you want to do some strength training. Your arms are weak. You don't say, well, I'll wait until my arms are strong and then I'll start lifting the weights. You have to lift the weights that you can manage and that strengthens the arm. And then they're able to move on to heavier and heavier and heavier weights. It's by exercising your discernment that it develops. And the second reason why you can't wait until your concentration is perfect is because sometimes issues come up in life. You've got to make decisions. And so you use the discernment you've got. You can say, well, I won't make a decision until I can make the absolute right decision. Because sometimes decisions get forced on you. And so you say, well, I'll do the best I can. And then if it turns out the best you can is still not good enough, well, you've learned. And you get another chance, and another, and another. And if there's some, you make some mistakes that you can't just drop and move on, or you go back and you try your best to compensate for them, and that, too, helps you to develop your discernment. So as we practice here, we're practicing between right and wrong. We're starting out with the discernment that comes from having read something or having heard something about this practice. And then we start practicing. And when things get it right, that's when we have the attainment. And you approximate right. You move in that direction. You don't take it personally when someone points out that you're not quite right yet. You take it as an opportunity to learn. You're the boxer that still exposes your ribs. Or you're the basket weaver who still hasn't quite mastered a particular weave. Okay, it's good to know. You may have thought, well, this is good enough. But if someone says, no, it's not good enough, it's not because they have ill will, it's because they, they care. Because this is a skill that really is life and death, the life and death of your goodness, the life and death of the well-being of the mind. And so the more all around you can make the, your skill, the more refined you can make it. It's all for the sake of your long-term welfare and happiness. So as the mind settles down, give it a chance to rest. And when it's rested, you can ask, what still is causing a sense of burdensomeness or a sense of stress? 
anything that weighs the mind down, or as one of the Forrester Johns said, anything that puts a squeeze on the mind. Is there anything still there? Look for it. The more assiduous you are in looking, the more you're going to benefit from the practice. So look carefully. What you see may not quite be right yet, may still be between right and wrong, but at the very least make sure you're heading in the right direction. <laughs>